God, I'm so thankful to be part of a congregation where there is an awful lot going on. Thank you for all of the different ways that we are seeking to follow you, Jesus. Thank you for the way that you are patient with us and work with us when we get it wrong, when we're not exactly in the center of your will, you continue to work with us and your grace comes alongside us and reminds us that it's not about where we've been. It's about where we are and where we're trusting you to take us. So God, with your Holy Spirit, would you pour out your blessing, your instruction, your heart to us today so that in these moments together we might hear clearly from you, not from David Jans, but from you, Holy Spirit. So speak to your church, either through me or in spite of me. Amen. So for reasons that I'm not completely clear about, I've been thinking a lot about pie this week. I've been thinking about all of the different kinds of pie that I have encountered in these three and a half decades of ministry. Berry pies and cream pies and rhubarb pies and peach pies and pumpkin pies and pizza pies <laughs> and apple pies. Now, I gotta tell you, on this Mother's Day weekend, out of all of the pies that I've encountered, none has touched the pies made by my mother. Maybe you feel that way about your mom, too. Maybe the pies or the cakes or the cookies or whatever, fill in the blank, is the best it's ever been when it comes from the kitchen of your mom. I feel that way about my mother's pies. She's 85 years old now. Would you pray for her, by the way? She took a nasty fall yesterday. She's with us this weekend, had hoped to be in worship today. Oh, that's interesting, there we go. Had hoped to be in, <laughs> guess you didn't like that part back there, huh? <laughs> hoped to be in worship today, but she, uh, she took a nasty fall and has a really big bump on her head. So pray for her if you would. Uh, but she, at 85, her fingers and her hands don't quite work the way they used to, and so it's a lot more difficult for her to make pies now than it was even say 10 years ago. So I'm really thankful that she has passed on the secrets of her scrumptious pies to my daughter. My daughter, Kate, knows the secrets of making pies like my mother did. And I like to think that as they were standing side by side in the kitchen, making pies together, something of my mother rubbed off on my daughter. My brother has been refinishing a gun stock. How's that for a shift from pies to gun stocks? My brother's been refinishing a stock on a, on a military rifle that looks something like this. The, the rifle's dated 1891. My father loved to refinish gun stocks. My brother and I spent hours standing beside him in the basement of our home watching him refinish stock after stock after stock. And we learned it so well that he and I have refinished all of the stocks on the guns that he owns and that I own. But that was a while ago. And my dad's been gone for 15 years now. So when this gun came into my brother's possession, he called me and he said, hey, do you remember anything about refinishing gun stocks? <laughs> And I said, well, I guess we're going to have to rely on what of dad has rubbed off on us. Are you hearing a theme? Rub off. Something of pie making rubbed off on my daughter. Something of refinishing gun stocks rubbed off on my brother and I from my dad. I want to take you to a a moment in Paul's life, the Apostle Paul. I want to take you to a moment in his life where something of him rubbed off on something else. So listen for that as we hear this story of a time when Paul found his way to Ephesus. It's in Acts chapter 19. While Apollos was in Corinth, Paul passed the in, through the interior regions and came to Ephesus, where he found some disciples. 
He said to them, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you became believers? They replied, we have not even heard that there is a Holy Spirit. And then Paul said, into what then were you baptized? They answered, into John's baptism. Paul said, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, telling the people to believe in the one who was to come after him, that is, in Jesus. On hearing this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. When Paul had laid his hands on them, the Holy Spirit came upon them, and they spoke in tongues and prophesied. Altogether, there were about 12 of them. Do you see something in there that rubbed off? God did extraordinary miracles through Paul so that when the handkerchiefs or aprons that had touched his skin were brought to the sick, their diseases left them and the evil spirits came out of them. Do you see something that rubbed off? Sisters and brothers, the word of God for the people of God. If you're thankful for that, say amen. 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 So Paul finds himself in Ephesus. As he often did when he went into a new town, he would try to find the people that might already believe in Jesus. So when he comes to Ephesus, he finds 12 of them. And he asks them, what about the Holy Spirit? Did you receive the Holy Spirit when you were baptized? They said, we don't even know about the Holy Spirit. Paul said, then what baptism did you receive? And they answered, we received the baptism of John. Now what's that? The baptism of John is tied back to John the Baptist. He was a guy that was Jesus' cousin, prepared the way for Jesus' ministry, actually baptized Jesus himself in the Jordan River, and that baptism happened kind of like this. People would come to John and would say, here's the places in my life where I am out of step with God's plan for me. I confess those things. And then John would baptize them as a way of starting fresh, a cleansing baptism. Paul says to the folks in Ephesus, that baptism is really important, but the purpose of it was to lead you to connection to a powerful one, a more powerful one, to Jesus. And so the people in Ephesus, those 12 people said, we want that baptism. And they are baptized in the name of Jesus and then Paul lays his hands on those who were baptized. And did you catch what happened? When he lays his hands on them, the Holy Spirit flows from Paul, rubs off from Paul into the lives of the people he put his hands on. And they begin to speak in tongues and they begin to prophesy. And then Luke tells us, Luke wrote the book of Acts, Luke tells us, that handkerchiefs and aprons that somehow touched Paul's skin were taken to places where people were struggling with life, where they were ill or where they were possessed by demons, where they were struggling with some other kind of circumstance in their life. Those handkerchiefs and aprons were taken to those people, laid on them, and illnesses went away. Evil spirits departed. Circumstances of life changed for those folks. Something of Paul, what? Rubbed off on handkerchiefs and aprons that were taken to people in need. Now, I don't want you to think I've gone bonkers here. Okay, I don't want you to think that I'm telling you to go out and find a holy man or a holy woman, take a handkerchief with you and get them to wipe their face with it and then you can go up and down the aisles of Butler Memorial healing people. That's not what I'm talking about, why? Because that's not why Luke included the story. This is the only place in the story where something like this exists. Why did Luke put it in there for you and for me? I think he put it in there to remind us that as powerful as Jesus Christ is to change how we engage our past, he is that powerful to give us energy and power for our present. Because the power that comes upon these guys that are touched either through Paul's hands or touched through a handkerchief, the power that comes upon them is a power that acts in real time. 
It isn't something we hope might happen. It isn't something that if we do certain things right, we'll get some of that power. It is a power that God chooses to give to those who say to Jesus, here's my heart. To those who say, Jesus, I'm going to start every part of my life with you. And when I do that, Jesus, I believe you're going to open up the doors for that kind of power to flow into our lives. Maybe you've been around a little while here at First Church and you've heard us use this phrase. First Church seeks to be a place where Jesus Christ changes lives. Now, I sense you're a little sleepy this morning, so I need you to read that with me. Okay? First Church seeks to be a place where Jesus Christ changes lives. Now, we chose that word changes intentionally. What's the past tense of the word change? Changed. What would be a future expression of the word change? Changing, will change as, will change, hope to change at some point in time. We chose the word change as because it's something that God's doing right now. I want us to be a church where God is busy changing life right now. I want your life and my life and our life together to be different because we have connected them to Jesus Christ. And I want them to be different not just in what our eternal destination is going to be, but in the day-to-day -day living that you and I have in real time. Why does that matter? Why does it matter that we connect with a Jesus that is present in real time? Well, let me ask you, have you ever felt like this? Anybody? Anybody felt like that before? Where life is just hard. And, you know, people that, that claim to be followers of Jesus, here's what I've experienced. People who claim to be followers of Jesus do some, some Christian-like things. They go to church. Maybe they pray before meals. Maybe they read the Bible here and there. They do some, some Christian things. But, but somewhere there's a disconnect between the, the one that we're following as Christians and the power that that one has to bring to our everyday life. See, we can say, yes, I believe in Jesus Christ. Yes, I'm going to heaven when I die, but not have much impact or much change in the way that we live day by day. And, and after we try to carry everything ourselves, I don't know about you, but doing life sometimes just wears me out. Are you out there? Oh, yeah. Doing life just wears me out. I get tired physically for sure but I get tired mentally and I get tired spiritually. Do I have some company? Life does that sometimes. I mean, after all, there's all kinds of responsibilities that we have. There's expectations that other people put on us. There's expectations that we sometimes put on ourselves. Life includes trying to match up with what society says is acceptable these days. Life includes trying to manage the consequences of the choices we've made sometimes. And then life includes the kids and the grandkids and the siblings and sometimes our 85-year-old parent. And trying to manage all of that, carry all of those responsibilities in our own strength brings us to a point of exhaustion, brings us to a point where we beat our head against the wall and we think to ourselves, is life ever going to change? Is this all that life is going to be? Is it always going to be this way in this rut? Have you ever been in a rut? Maybe you find yourself in one this morning. More like a hamster wheel. You get up, you get on the wheel, you run until you can't run anymore, you collapse, you get up the next day and everything is all over again. I think we all get into those moments, those periods of our lives. And we get into that place, I think, at least I'm speaking for this preacher, we get into that place in our lives because we try to do it all ourselves. We haven't made the connection yet between this Jesus that says to you and to me about our past our past is not a death sentence because of Jesus Christ. 
But we don't get to that point where we can say with, with courage and joy and hope that our present has power because of Jesus Christ. That the rut is there sometimes, the treadmill is there, the hamster wheel is there, but we can engage those things with a power that goes beyond us. You see, friends, when we bloom as people who are followers of God, when we choose to say to God, I want to start every part of my life with you, that opens the doors for a power to flow into our life. And watch this, it's the same power that rubbed off of Paul. Don't miss that. I'm not talking about a little extra horsepower here and there. I'm talking about the power that rubbed off of Paul, flowed through Paul, took handkerchiefs and made them healing. That's the power that can flow into your life and into my life. Now, I confess to you that we don't talk as much about that as we do about what Jesus does for our past or for our future. I want to change that. I want to tell you with all that I have, the good news of connecting life to Jesus Christ is that when we do, there is a power that flows into our life and all of a sudden the rut can be engaged with joy because we know that God is at work in the midst of it. Can I give you this piece of good news? God never wastes a hurt. You out there? God never wastes a hurt. The power of God at work in present moments takes hurtful times, struggling times, rut times. Can I say it this way? God never wastes a rut. God is always at work in that place. When we are willing to say, Jesus, here's my heart. I will define every part of my life from my connection to you. When we do that, there is a power that flows into our life that makes the, the rut manageable, and it even makes it joyful. Jesus was with his disciples not long before he ascended into heaven, and they're having a conversation. And his disciples say to him, Lord, is this the time you're going you're to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is this the time when everything that's been wrong is going to be set right? Jesus says to them, you know what? It's not for you, it's not even for me, to know the times and the seasons that the Father has set by his own authority. But what I can tell you is this, stay here in town, stay in Jerusalem, because not long from now, something's gonna happen that is gonna change your life and change the world. This is what he says. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. Now imagine that you are one of the 12 that hear Jesus say that. You're one of his disciples, and you hear Jesus say that. Imagine, first of all, that you're Peter. You're a fisherman by trade. And this guy has come along and, and said something to you at a moment in your life that was so powerful that you decided when he said, come and follow me, you decided to follow him. And you followed this Jesus for three years. You watched him die horribly on a cross. You thought it was done. But three days later, he came back to life. And everything now is like, I'm not sure what's real anymore. And then this Jesus says to you, Peter, stay here. Not long from now, you are going to receive the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to have power. And the power that you're going to get is going to help you tell my story to the ends of the earth. Wow. From the Sea of Galilee to Rome itself, Peter would travel. Now think about it. This guy, this Peter, this common ordinary guy is infused with the power of the Holy Spirit and he becomes unafraid of anything. These 12 guys are not afraid of illness. They're not afraid of demons. They're not afraid of authority. They're not afraid of even being martyred, which many of them were. The power of this spirit, the power of this living Jesus in their life caused them to not be afraid of anything. Why? Because their life was defined by that power. What is that power? How does that power operate in our life? Here, I want you to take this with you. The present, life in real time, mine, yours, and ours can have power because of Jesus Christ.
Is that good news for you today? Is that good news? See, Jesus Christ not only changes your past. And, and how does Jesus do that? Does Jesus cause all the mistakes you made to not be there anymore? Well, in a way, yeah. You still have consequences to deal with it. But the mistakes you made in your past is not a death sentence for you. Don't walk out of here today thinking that you have made so many mistakes that Jesus Christ can't love you. Can I tell you the good news? Jesus Christ loves you in spite of the mistakes you've made. Hallelujah. Amen. Yeah, you know, it works a little better if you put them together a little louder. Okay? <laughs> it is a little that, that's better. That's better. But I don't want you to walk out of here this morning either without hearing me say this. The life you're living, hard as it might be, the rut you found yourself in, the treadmill that you're on, that can have power from the Holy Spirit. And it's not just a little bit of power, it's not just a little extra horsepower, it is the power of creation itself, the power that Paul had, the power that flowed through Paul, the power that flowed through Jesus can flow into your life and into my life and make a rut something more than a rut, a place of blessing. I know that seems crazy. I know it doesn't seem real, but I'm here as a living proof that Jesus Christ will do that to the hard places and the rut places of life. How about you? Can I get a witness? Jesus Christ will do that. So let me bring you back to the song that we sang just a few minutes ago. I want you to ponder some of the words in this song. Hear the word roaring as thunder with a new future to tell. For the dry season is over. There is a cloud beginning to swell. Do you have that image? The dry season is over. There is a cloud beginning to swell. To the skies, heavy with blessing. Lift your eyes and offer your heart. Jesus Christ opened the heavens. Now we receive the Spirit of God. Powerful, profound words. Can I ask you, do you suppose that sometime in the next 15 minutes, or hour, or day, or week, we, we might see a cloud? You suppose? After all, it's central western Pennsylvania. We see a lot of clouds around here. Can I ask you, when the clouds that you see are kind of dark and gray and maybe even black and there's rumbles and, and lights flashing from it, what do you do when you see those things? How do you respond to them? Okay, that works. You kind of you get away, right? You, you, you get indoors. You, you get out of the path of the storm. I love the line in that song. To the skies, heavy with blessing. What if we looked at clouds just a little differently this week? What if instead of... The clouds were triggers for us to remember that even when it's dark, even when it's gray, even when it's in a rut, the present, whatever the present is, can have power because of Jesus Christ. What if storm clouds were about ready to unleash blessing, blessing instead of unleash hell? What if? Would that change the way you engaged your day-to-day -day living? Would it change the way if you started every morning, Jesus, here's my heart and anticipated that in your rut, whatever it happened to be, Jesus Christ, the power of Jesus Christ is working in that place. All of a sudden, things begin to change. See, it's our choice, friends. We can live bound to a past that is fatal in our minds, or we can live free from the past in the joy and the strength of Jesus Christ. We can engage our present, woe is me, here we go again, it's never going to change. Or we can engage our present by saying, Lord Jesus, I know you're here. Here's my heart. Show me what you're doing in the ruts of my days. It's our choice. Let me leave you with this. 
When the root is deep, there is no reason to fear the storm. Do you see the root? What does the root say? Huh? Somebody's been trying to tell you that. When the root is deep, there is no reason to fear the storm. Amen? Amen. Father, thank you for these moments together today. God, I confess to you that there is so many times when the rut in my life steals the joy because I forget that it's not really mine to carry. The responsibilities, the expectations, the society's thoughts, and the challenges of family life. and God, that's not really mine to carry. It's yours. I try to carry it. We all do. But remind us, Lord, that because Jesus is alive and because the power of the Holy Spirit is at work in our present, that, Lord, our present can have power because of Jesus Christ. And the power that you want to give to us is a power that, uh, that just changes everything, God. It, it, it turns ruts into opportunities. It turns storm clouds into blessings. It turns everyday living into opportunities to encounter a living God. I don't know where my brothers and sisters in this room are today with the ruts and the challenges of their present living. But God, by your Holy Spirit, would you pour out upon every one of us in this room? And would you help us to have a power that goes beyond ourselves, that connects us to you, and ultimately brings to our lips a song of worship because of the God that can take a rut and make it a blessing. This is our prayer in the name of Christ. And everyone said, Amen.